Horde members, we are back, and today we're going to talk about the might of the dwarves in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. You can check out our previous faction focus videos. Uh, let's see, we've done humans, and we've, of course, done elves. And so now there's no law, uh, love lost between elves and dwarves. So we're going to talk about the dwarves in this game and what they can do. To be clear, just up front, the beginning of this video, I want to make sure you know, this is not a how to play Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea video. Uh, video. That's a video for another time in another place. Today, we're just going to talk about the dwarves, who they are, and what they can do in this game. As you know, if you already play Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, the towers available to you, or the, the Citadel available to you, is three sizes high. There's a level one Citadel, a level two Citadel, and a level three Citadel. At each different level, these dwarves get stronger and stronger and stronger, as do their buildings, and does the availability of hiring, recruiting, better character figures. So let's dig into this. Starting with level one, we're going to talk about the blacksmith. Where would a dwarven uh, nation be without its blacksmith? Well, here's where they are with the blacksmith. The blacksmith at level one here allows your warriors when they are, they gain plus one strength when battling in a mountains region. So everybody knows about dwarves and their love for mountains and the tunnels within, they get plus one strength when battling in a mountain's region. At level two, these warriors may occupy mountain regions like here. They may occupy them as they are serfs and collect or as if they were serfs. So normally only serfs get to collect resources for your armies in this particular instance, as long as it's a mountain region, Warriors will also collect that precious, precious ore that dwarves love so much. And at level three, this is incredible. At level three, when you destroy a tower, like this one, these elves, sneaksy elves, if you destroy their tower, you may immediately replace with one of yours at no cost. No cost. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous ability. I can't say it enough how ridiculous that is. First of all, not only does it not take any cost, it doesn't take an action. You just fight, defeat their tower, and replace it with one of yours. Keep in mind, one of the victory conditions in this game is to have all of your towers in play. So realistically, that's a freebie. Take out your opponent's tower, get one of yours for free. I really think that's... Uh, pretty hefty ability for the dwarves to get. Now, the blacksmith comes with its own hero of sorts that I would like to call him. This is the cannoneer, this dwarf hero unit. His name is Tugsy Wararm. Of course it is. Take a look at Tugsy here. Can I bring Tugsy up closer to the camera? Look at that. He's literally carrying a cannon. So Tugsy Wararm, a walking cannon himself, a mobile mortar, a hulking hurricane of firepower, Tugsy smote the hordes who stood against the mighty dwarven kingdom. The molten shells he fires are filled with refined brimstone mined from the dwarven mountains, and their explosions can easily dismantle the wing or sail of any adversarial craft. Now that's going to come in uh, play here shortly. At level one, Tugsy gets plus one attack against vehicles, which will also come in play here very shortly. So make sure when Tugsy's fighting, he is fighting against an opponent's air vessel or sea ship. He gets plus two strength at level two if battling an army with three or more units. So put him in a fight with some people. He loves a good scrap. And at level three, he gains, you gain two victory points if the cannoneer wins a battle against a vessel. So not only is he stronger against vessels, put him against a vessel that's full. Here, let's, let's get an uh, example. Let's put this airship in a fight with this elven corsair right here in front of the camera. So if this airship were to fight this elven Corsair right here, this would be against three, the ship and two, right? He would get plus two strength, plus one against vessel. So he is seven strength by himself, by himself. He's seven strength. Then he gets, of course, the strength of the, of the actual uh, Griffin, which is two strength. And he gets the strength of anybody else that's on the ship. And if he defeats that vessel, he get, you gain two victory points. I mean, the blacksmith tree alone is a very viable uh, path to victory if you choose the dwarven faction as your go-to to play this game. 
All right, let's move on to the monastery. Now, I know I was just hyping up this blacksmith from ground floor up, but I recommend you starting with the monastery, and here's why. The level one ability of the monastery, so if you're just sitting here at a lowly level one citadel, the monastery allows you to all build actions cost one less ore. All of them. Everything you build costs one less ore. So if nothing else, start by building that monastery so everything else you do in this game is cheaper. I think that's huge. I mean, everything costs ore. Um, the cannoneer costs ore. The ship costs ore. Of course, raising your capital uh, building costs ore. Uh, what else costs ore in here? I think your towers cost ore. Yep, the towers cost ore. As a matter of fact, the towers cost ore uh, the farther away they are from your capital, they, uh, they cost more. So just consider that uh, ore, is a, ore is something you're going to need. And if you, pay, if you pay to build the monastery, you're going to save ore for the entire game. All right, level two. I think I got that point across. Level two. Towers and armies adjacent to your towers on the same continent are plus one strength when defending. So towers and armies adjacent to your towers. So in this particular instance, uh, this tower and this army here would be plus one strength. This army is plus one strength. This tower is plus one strength um, uh, if they're on the same continent, right? So towers and armies adjacent to your towers on the same continent are plus, are plus one strength when defending. Great stuff. Level three, the monastery. Each mountainous region you control at the end of the game is worth an additional victory point for a maximum of six. So if you control this mountain region and this mountain region, that's two extra points right there. Maybe you control a mountain region. Let's see, is there one way off to the side here, there? Maybe you control that one as well, another victory point. The elves do something similar with their forest region. You can watch the elf faction focus video here. I'll put it in the links um, in the edited version of this video. Moving on to the mead hall. Look, dwarves love their blacksmith and forges. They love their monasteries and their deities and their priests and priestesses. Well, I got to talk about the priestess. I can't move on to the next thing yet. The priestess. I almost forgot about the priestess. Uvalin Goldborn would have been so upset. Uvalin Goldborn has focused her studies on fanning the internal fires of her people. Like many others in the Golden Mountain Monastery, she worships and investigates the celestial perfection held in all dwarven blood. By directing her cantrips and harnessing this sanguine life force, she enhances the strength and fortitude of her dwarven soldiers. So Uvalin Gold, uh, Uvalin Gold born at level one. When marching any army, you may place the priestess into that army. So back down here, where is Uvalin? Ah, Uvalin is on the ship. That's a great place for her. And I'll tell you why. I decide to say, you know, I want to march this army here. I can just bring Uvalin because it says so. When marching any army, you may place the priestess into that army. So she just comes along for the trip. At level two, when marching, you may instead move any units, including enemy units, from regions adjacent to the priestess into her region. So we've got, uh, maybe we've got the priestess here with a warrior. And we want to march and instead move any units, including enemy units, from regions adjacent to the priestess into her region. So We've got a setup like this. I say I want to march with the priestess, or better yet, I want to take the elf commander out. I'm going to march with the priest, or march with this army. Instead of marching that army, I can drag this elf commander into here and just lay waste to him right there. And uh, level three, gain two victory points if the priestess wins a battle after using her level one or two abilities. So after using this marching ability, if she wins this battle, she will gain our team an extra two victory points. Way to go, Uvalin. That is the monastery. Now, let's talk about the Mead Hall. What do you do with all this pent-up energy and aggression once you've already won the fight? Well, you go and drink some Dwarven Ale. So, you're going to build a Mead Hall. And why you build a Mead Hall? Well, at level one, that Mead Hall, when an army containing serfs enters a mountain region, you gain one ore. So just by, let's put these guys back, just by, mm, this is serfs, marching these serfs here, I gain one ore just because I moved into the mountain region. I don't have to wait for the uh, resource collection part of the turn. Just marching in there gives it to me. 
When defending the capital city at level two, the meat hall allows the serfs in the courtyard and action bar gain plus one strength. So let's look, look at that just a little bit. The courtyard here is where figures are and before they are um, summoned to the board, for lack of a better, recruited to the, to the game board here. Well, they're always hanging out in the courtyard, which kind of means that the courtyard is actually inside the Capitol building here. So all of those, all of those serfs and, uh, let's see, is it serfs and warriors? Just the serfs. All the serfs in the courtyard and the action bar are plus one strength. Now the action bar here, when you take an action on your turn, you actually move a surf from here and you put it up here on the action bar. And that's, a, for example, the march action. So if I put the march or the surf there to go marching, he's also worth plus one strength when defending the capital. So you really bolster your forces here on the board by building a level two capital city and your level two mead hall. At level three, if you have two surfs in a mountain region, just like this one, let's take a closer look. Two surfs in a mountain region, that region will also collect two mana. So not only will it collect two ore for your team, it'll collect two mana. Maybe you use that mana to cast spells with your priestess. Who knows? That is the celebratory mead hall. Board members, I forgot to mention the Marauder. When you build the mead hall for the dwarf faction, let's talk about the Marauder now. The Marauder name is Captain Flintbeard. Decades of crawling through narrow passages, hunting treasures has given Captain Flintbeard one distinct advantage, a mental map of the vast cave networks in Ogmore. His enemies are known to disappear in accidental cave-ins and then fall on top of bullets. And whenever a vessel is ready to depart, he always seems to be on board, prefers to uh, avoid walking. So that is Captain Flintbeard. Let's take, a, let's take a quick look at Captain Flintbeard here. Such a great picture. Such great artwork. All right, so Captain Flintbeard, you can see the board was kind of tore down because I had finished and came back to do this quick edit for Captain Flintbeard. So, at level one, we're going to talk about level one Marauder Captain Flintbeard. When moving a vessel, you may place the Marauder into that vessel. So if Captain Flintbeard's over here hanging out in the wheat fields for who knows why, maybe he somebody was accidentally falling on bullets, and the ship decides to set sail to this continent, he pretty much says, hurry, wait for me, and he joins the ship. He just gets to go right on it, so I don't have to march him all the way across the board. With a level two citadel uh, capital, when the Marauder destroys an enemy vessel, gain three resources of your choice. So if you could imagine um, having the cannoneer, Tugsy, and the Marauder on the same vessel, if they destroy an enemy vessel, that's amazing. Because Tugsy gets plus strength against vessels, and the Marauder gets more loot when he destroys a vessel. So last but not least, at level three, when the Marauder wins a battle, gain two resources of your choice. Now, we just talked about uh, him destroying a vessel and getting three resources of your choice. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The card does indeed say that it stacks. So if he destroys an enemy vessel with your level three capital building in play, that's right, he's bringing back a whopping five resources of your choice. That could really, really, really be a game changer for the Dwarf faction. Now we move on to the Sea Dock. How do you get boats in place? Well, you build yourself a Sea Dock, that's how. The Sea Dock at level one gives the barge uh, plus one strength if it has two units aboard. So this particular barge here would not have that because it only has one warrior. So if you're gonna build a Sea Dock, and you're gonna field your barge, make sure you fully stock it with two units. That way it's plus one strength. It would be then a four strength ship. At level two, it gets plus two strength when defending. And level three, the barge is plus two strength when battling towers or capital cities. Now notice all the capital cities areas, uh, maybe go top side here, all the capital city areas on the board are always on the coastal region. I don't have it set up where you can see. Well, you can see, I'll point with it this here, this area here. And then of course, this capital here, this capital here. Those are all you can see on the board right now. So the ship can actually attack from the shore and it would get plus two attack when battling towers or capital cities. That would raise it to five. And it gets an additional plus one attack if two units are aboard. So that makes it a six. 
if you use, we're going to put all this together now, if you use your cannoneer as one of these people on the boat, so the cannoneer would be for, um, so he would be four, so that's 10. He'd be 10 strength, and then, of course, you would have a warrior who would just have two strength, so 10, 12. That'd be a 12 strength ship all by itself as it sits there if it was to go attack a capital city or a tower. I think it's a pretty good plan. Um, now, I don't know about their love for the sea or love for the air, but we got to talk about their airship, which they have commandeered a griffin. Uh, let's see. Actually, is this the griffin? No, this is the human airship. Where is the dwarven? Ah, here it is. I had the wrong airship. Much cooler. Let's get our cannoneer back up here. He'll fire out the rear. Okay. We've got ourselves a griffin flying about with two dwarves on it. At level one, the griffin collects two ore if in a mountain region. So it now collects as if it's a surf also and collects twice as much. At level two, if that griffin is destroyed in battle, all other units may retreat at no cost. Kind of nice. If they have a spot to go to or fall off the back, they could retreat at no cost. And then level three, the griffin has plus two strength if a hero is aboard. So once again, make sure you get your cannoneer, good old Tugsy war arm onto these vessels because now it's a two strength, Four strength. That thing by itself is four strength just because Tugsy is on the on the ship. And then of course Tugsy's an additional four, uh, five, six if he's battling a, an army with three or more units. So that, ladies and gentlemen, are is the dwarves abilities in a nutshell. I highly recommend you give this army a shot. Again, my my best guess for best strategies, or at least a starting strategy for you, would be to build the monastery first. Lower the cost of everything else you do. Get those. Uh, get the the blacksmith in play. Destroy the opponent's towers. Get your own towers for free. Make sure you build the cannoneer. Put them on a ship, on airship or a sea ship, and go for the win. Thanks so much for attending the live stream. I do appreciate that. That's twitch.tv slash boardroomgamer. If you're checking out this replay on YouTube, it's the full edited replay where I try to fix any mistakes I made, blunders, bloopers, or add any other fun things into the video. Thanks so much for watching the YouTube video. I do appreciate, appreciate it. Please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. It really does help me out. And as always, we'll see you at the next boardroom meeting.